My name is Jerry Gill. Today is June 27th, 2009. I'm visiting with Tom Keyes, former director of the Student Union at Oklahoma State University. And we're in the Student Union in his old office, as a matter of fact, on the OSU campus in Stillwater, Oklahoma. Uh, this interview is for the O-State Stories Project, which is part of the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program. Tom, thanks for taking time to visit with us today. And there's a special event going on today that brings you here to the Union. Well, it's my pleasure to be here with you, mm -hmm. Jerry. Yeah, we're having a little reunion of some former directors and uh, former members of our staff. And we're looking forward to having a nice day of visiting. Great. Well, Tom, what do we, you know, maybe if we go back to the start. Sure. Uh, can you tell a little bit about where you grew up and your, your early life? Well, I was originally from uh, Louisiana. My home was in Natchitoches, uh, Louisiana. Uh, a little bit of history of that that uh, community. It's the oldest permanent settlement in the Louisiana Purchase, founded in 1714. Wow. So it's been around for a while. I, I grew up in Natchitoches. It was a nice place to grow up. A little community about, oh, 17, 18,000. Uh, graduated from high school there, did my undergraduate work at uh, Louisiana State University in, in finance. Uh, came back to Natchitoches to do a, a master's program in student personnel because that was the only program in the state that dealt with uh, higher education. Um, when I was uh, growing up, I was pretty involved in athletics, um, played football, played basketball. Uh, we had some success in basketball, uh, more success as, as, as a basketball team than we did a football team, but uh, like every other kid had visions of uh, playing ball at, at LSU at that time and a uh, pretty severe knee injury stopped all of that so I had to trace uh, other paths for a career or, or, or playing and that kind of deal. But had a good experience at LSU, got very involved in campus life kinds of things, was uh, Ended up uh, being in student government as a vice president for of the student body. Uh, served on the union governing board. Uh, served on the student union leadership cabinet, which those things kind of cut my uh, I cut my teeth on those mm -hmm. and kind of uh, uh, another dean of students encouraged me to get into this kind of business and. Mm -hmm. Uh, that was kind of my career path, was uh, having a good and a great out-of-class experience uh, as an undergraduate kind of got me started into all of this. Tom, sort of circling back a little bit <clears throat> to your early life, were there some uh, values and lessons that you learned growing up uh, from your family that influenced you? Oh, exactly. Uh, you know, like, like all of us, we pretty much owe who we are to our parents. And mm -hmm. um, my dad was... Uh, in private business. He owned his own construction company and uh, at that time, uh, you know, my mother raised the three of us, three, uh, had an older brother and a younger sister. She stayed home as a housewife, which in those days, you know, that was done a lot more than, than now. Mm -hmm. um, I think the primary thing uh, that I would latch on to just immediately and briefly is uh, a work ethic. Um, uh, kind of a philosophy of uh, don't don't forget where you come from. Um, uh, other analogies of uh, kind of a sports analogy: uh, always stay in balance. Um, that wasn't just physical, but it was uh, mm -hmm. mental and the way you you led your life. Just mm -hmm. uh, don't reach, uh, you know. Have goals and have dreams, but don't reach so far that you're out of balance with who you are and what you are. And work hard, and uh, uh, those, those kinds of things came to me from from my parents. Tom, obviously, as you indicated earlier, so you kind of cut your your teeth on student union work there mm -hmm. as part of their their student uh, union activities. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. We call it board here, but. Right. Uh, but what is the story? But how did you, did you get to Oklahoma State University? Did you come straight from your? You did your? No. You know, after you finished your undergrad. Uh, it's kind of an interesting story. Interesting for me. Actually, when I finished my master's degree, my first job was uh, uh, by title coordinator of student activities at a small school in Augusta, Georgia. At the, at the time, it was Augusta College. Mm -hmm. uh, now I think it's Augusta State University. But I was hired there. Uh, kind of in the student activities stuff. Mm -hmm. 
business. Uh, and I was there only about a year. And uh, at, in the summer of 1969, uh, actually I watched them land on the moon in a, in a lounge at the University of Iowa because I was there on a, a two-week workshop. Uh, just to put that in perspective, we were there uh, in this workshop that was being sponsored by the Association of College Unions International uh, to deal with campus unrest because that spring, um, this little historical perspective, that spring, University of Iowa had been shut down due to campus unrest. They just quit and went home early that year. And we were there um, for a two-week workshop kind of learning how to deal with some of those issues and so on. Um, while there, uh, a friend of mine that I had gone to school with contacted me and Winston Schindel, of all people, had hired, just hired this, this person, this mm -hmm. friend of mine, as the first assistant director of student activities. Mm -hmm. Well, he contacted me saying Winston had said that um, there's another job open at Oklahoma State, was a, an assistant dean of students. Uh, working primarily with uh, fraternities, um, which is a legendary name out of, in the history of, of campus life, was Daryl Troxell. Troxell Dean had, Trox. had Dean Trox, who had been formerly by title Dean of Men, uh, had moved to become an associate dean of students, and they were looking to replace uh, Trox in that mm -hmm. process. And so, long story short, they contacted me, um, and I left that workshop, um, in fact there's a little network there, Jan Carlson who worked here for a long time, he and I were rooming together uh, at that particular workshop. So Jan and another colleague uh, saw to it that I got on the airplane and got to Stillwater, uh, Oklahoma. I'd never been to Oklahoma in my life. <laughs> I never thought about going to Oklahoma. And um, so long story short, I contacted. I flew in here, did an interview. The per first person I met who met me at the plane was uh, Winston Schindel. So we imprinted there very quickly and uh, Trox and uh, Bob Schmalfeld, who was Dean of Students, hired me for that job. Uh, I had some uh, real decision making to do in terms of whether I wanted to come to Oklahoma State. Uh, but we did make the decision. We came here uh, primarily to work at a larger university, one that was uh, a lot like in philosophy, in history, um, in, in nature, a lot like LSU. They were both land-grant schools, comprehensive universities, an opportunity for me to move to a comprehensive university, and also an opportunity for me to pursue a doctorate. So I said, I'll come and stay for four years. I'll get my doctorate. <laughs> work uh, in the fraternity area and in student discipline and orientation and those kinds of responsibilities at that time. Uh, I'll, I'll get my doctorate and then move on and uh, 36 years later I retired from the university. <laughs> <laughs> well Tom, what was your, uh, your background uh, in terms of your uh, academic degrees before you come to OSU and start your doctorate? Um, I have an undergraduate from LSU in, uh, in, in finance mm -hmm. out of the College of Business. And I had a master's in education and student personnel. Mm -hmm. And then I came here and I got my, uh, uh, my EDD mm -hmm. uh, in student personnel slash uh, applied behavioral studies, uh, higher ed administration, kind of a mix of, mm -hmm. of those three things. Mm -hmm. Well, how long were you in that position? You were then assistant? <clears throat> I was assistant, assistant dean, dean of students, students for six years. Okay. And uh, then I was hired by Norman Moore, mm -hmm. uh, who was vice president for student services at that time, to work in his office, um, kind of as an organization development person. Mm -hmm. We were doing a lot of evaluation and uh, other kinds of uh, program development that we were trying to do out of the that office. Uh, I worked with the uh, President's Leadership Council mm -hmm. while I was in that capacity. I worked for two years uh, for Norman. 
So Tom, let me just sort of so you were you were a associate uh, assistant dean of yeah. student affairs from '69 to '70. Seventy. Five. Five and then 75 to 77 Seven. working in uh, Dr. Yeah, Moore's right. office. Yeah. Okay. Then, then after 77, uh, Jay Boggs, who was vice president for academic affairs and research, uh, now the, carries the provost title or chief mm -hmm. academic officer, um, I, I moved to his office um, on his staff as a uh, Director of Academic Programs and Services, uh, and I was there five and a half years. And in uh, in January of 1982, I became Union Director. Did did, did you go through a, a formal process, or was it just just an internal search? How did they do that, Tom? For the Union Director job. Union job? Director position. No, it was a national search. Mm -hmm. um, interestingly enough, I had never really formally been employed in any kind of student union uh, facility. I had not sat in the traditional chairs of, uh, of advancing through the ranks of uh, union director, but I was a part of a national search. Uh, interestingly enough, I uh, this is kind of a little aside, but earlier we were talking about all of that, and uh, uh, within a few months after I got hired, I was at a, at a, a national convention, and got to know the other three finalists and thought, how did I get hired? Because they were pretty prominent in, the, in that whole profession. Um, but I was hired and, and uh, again, thinking I would stay not a long time, I was uh, 23 years as union director. Tom came in there. Obviously, there's a lot of strengths to build on. You've had Abe Hesser, Norman Moore, Winston Shindell, some outstanding uh, directors. What were some strengths you wanted to build on, and and, and what were some of your initial goals uh, and priorities for the student union? Okay. Um, probably the initial response, just as, as you set it up, there were a lot of pretty uh, significant people that had been in the role of uh, union director. Uh, of course, most things in this in this union. Uh, kind of set into motion by Abe Hesser. Um, he was legendary, as, as Trox was legendary in the fraternity field. Uh, Abe was uh, uh, carried the same weight in, in the college union business, and uh, of course, you know Norman and and Winston. I had known Winston uh, very well uh, when he was in this position. In fact, it was Winston that had encouraged me to even consider the union. Mm -hmm. uh, just as an aside, I had two options at that point. One was I was a finalist for a, uh, a dean of students job at the University of Florida. Mm -hmm. And while I was on an interview uh, down in Gainesville at the University of Florida, interviewing for this dean of students job, the person who was chairman of the selection committee was the, was the union director at Florida. And he and I started talking about college unions and the operations, the philosophy, the purpose, and so on. And, at re and Winston had just encouraged me to consider the position. I had never given it any thought at all. And it was that conversation that really kind of tweaked my interest. So I, I, I flew home and immediately contacted the vice president at uh, Florida and said, I don't think I want to be considered for the position. I want to throw my hat in the ring for uh, mm -hmm. the student union mm -hmm. director's job here. I know I'm not answering your question, but I'll get to it in a minute. Uh, the thing that really attracted me about that was it was in, in, the, in the, the student affairs, within the boundaries of the student affairs profession and mix, uh, but it afforded me an opportunity, I thought, to combine a lot of my experiences, my business background, having grown up in a business, having my initial degree being in business, uh, my understanding and experience in student affairs thing, plus the network I had built in academic affairs. Mm -hmm. So I thought, I, you know, and I think that's probably why I was picked, although I did mm -hmm. not have a whole lot of hands-on experience as a union director, was that there were, I, I felt there was a breadth of mm -hmm. knowledge and mm -hmm. understanding and networks 
that I could bring to the table that perhaps other other candidates mm -hmm. didn't at that time, being more of a traditional background. So, uh, day one, and I tried to follow this philosophy all the way through, was with, with staff and so on to say, look, I've never been here. I, you know, I've never been in, in a job like this. I said, there are some things that I can bring to the table, but as far as having uh, uh, a real understanding of, of uh, uh, the hands-on kind of processes, we're going to have to work together. I'm going to have to depend on you because I can't cook, <laughs> uh, but there are some things I can do that, that I think I can bring to the table that would facilitate this. Back to your initial question, now let's begin to look at the, the principles, the programs, the mix of everything in this union that we think is uh, near and dear to our hearts and our philosophies that we want to keep mm -hmm. and the traditions that have been established but at the, and, and let's honor those and respect those but at the same time let's look at how we can change what we need to change what we need to venture into to stay at the cutting edge for our students because students uh, you know they're our, our, our mainstay uh, we're here to serve the, the, the university community, students, faculty, staff, alumni, and guests. It's probably the largest uh, uh, market and, and constituency that anybody else on the campus would have. How do we stay at the cutting edge of trying to address their needs mm -hmm. in terms of the out-of-class experience? And that's, that's pretty much the philosophy that we hung on. One was, uh, I don't know nearly everything there is to know, but uh, when we combine all of our knowledge and all of our expertise, uh, you know, we have the power to do whatever we think we need to do to continue to address. So, in summary, respect that which has, you know, those that have contributed before, but not be so staid in that that we can't change. Uh, be flexible enough and adaptive enough through the years to try to stay at that cutting edge for those that we serve. That's kind of what drove us. Tom, it sounds like your conversation to the student program was a priority for you. Student program is always a, a priority. It's, it's fundamental. Uh, through our years, uh, I, I can tell you that it was difficult to continue to address, to, to maintain that priority when, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, when you're talking to students, faculty, alumni, guests of the university, and plus uh, being an auxiliary where you have to have an economic engine that will drive and support all of those needs, uh, <clears throat> we tried very hard not to lose sight of the fact that the student program was, was uh, more than the student program, I think to me a better term was the, the out-of-class experience. Mm -hmm. Uh, was stayed as foremost in our minds as we could and that we had all those other things that would support it. And it was difficult at times to, going back to my operative word, staying in balance with everything. Uh, you know as well as I do, and I'm being a little bit conversational and, and informative here and I hope it's okay, but uh, there was probably not a, uh, at certain years, uh, not a week that would go by, certainly not a month that would go by, that someone would need or want more space for something else that was not necessarily primary to the mission of the union, but we were trying to accommodate those needs as well. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> trying to address some of the pent-up needs for capital improvements and repairs on a building that was uh, heavily used, therefore getting very uh, well-worn was a real challenge for us. Um, you touched on some of these, but you, you might elaborate a little bit more on what I'll call the stakeholders, yeah. the primary being the students, the other constituencies that you serve. Yeah. Could you speak to that a little more? Well, uh, as I've said, you know, students, faculty, staff, alumni, mm -hmm. guests of the university, that's just about everybody that would walk through the building. Uh, and, and uh, you know, again, trying to maintain a balance among all of those. Um, 
and 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 our constituency is is pretty obvious. Uh, uh, you know, the students. You know who they are. Faculty. You know, they had particular wants and needs, and how to address them and support their needs. Mm -hmm. uh, and you probably don't get. You know, people probably don't give a whole lot of thought to. Well, you know, the faculty teach over in the classroom building, and that. What, how does that? Well, uh, you know, our whole bookstore is. You know, is a support effort to the, to the teaching and learning complex and communicating effectively with them regarding uh, providing the uh, academic materials that are used in the classroom. That's very supportive. Uh, it's a lot of our programming, we try to co-program with faculty, uh, you know, hit some areas that, that uh, faculty would have an interest in, not in just in terms of attending, but uh, programming for students that we would use faculty to mm -hmm. to assist us in, in uh, those programs um, discussion groups following presentations that would be led you know we'd bring in a speaker and so on uh, and then we'd have faculty come in with discussion groups after that and try you know try to do some things with them uh, uh, staff the same way um, guests. Uh, at one point we were the continuing education facility for Oklahoma State University. Uh, either fortunately or unfortunately, now I think it's, it's fortunately, uh, you know, Oklahoma State's been able to develop some other facilities and uh, buildings and, and meeting places to accommodate the continuing education aspect of, of the university, both, uh, you know, as, as part of the university's mission of outreach and, and uh, that, that sort. Uh, the Student Union House, the Alumni Association, yeah. the OSU Foundation, right. a lot of operations yeah. people forget about. Yeah. They? One of the unique and, and challenging aspects of that is in, in terms of keeping all that in balance. This union has always been fairly unique in terms of the mix of, uh, of that which is contained within this building. I mean, we would, you know, you go from the obvious of food service and, and uh, not every union has a bookstore, but we had a bookstore. Not every union had retail facilities or shops. We had shops. But in addition, as, as you mentioned, uh, you know, certainly very few had, uh, had a hotel or parking structures, uh, but I don't know of any other college union that had its Board of Regents offices right here in the building, or its alumni uh, facilities, or the OSU Foundation was located here. Uh, the the uh, career services, the counseling center, and those were in the early days. And then when we added um, the student services center to the building in the late 90s, um, that really made it uh, uh, a whole, you know, everything you wanted or needed to do mm -hmm. at the university could basically be found right here when we added, oh, was it the bursar, the registrar, um, uh, financial aid, um, um, all of those really just made this a very unique facility in terms of, of all of the services that were wrapped together in one facility. Yeah which I think was one of the nicest things we could have ever done for, for students. Tom sort of brings, uh, sort of begs the question, how do you, how, how did you, how were you organized your organizational structure and, and, and how was it managed uh, during your right. tenure? I think that we kept our organizational structure very flat, mm -hmm. uh, on purpose. Mm -hmm. um, th th that was my design was uh, to keep it as flat as possible. We were organized uh, by departments. Uh, I, hopefully I was smart enough to hire some good people as department heads for these various units and then get out of their way and let them do their thing. My job was to provide them the opportunities to succeed. Uh, the resources, the wherewithal to do what they were hired to do and uh, to manage, to coach. Uh, it was very much a coaching kind of thing, uh, trying to, to motivate trying to counsel, uh, working together with a master plan for the building in terms of where we wanted to go and where we wanted to be. 
unfortunately we didn't have the resources to get there in a hurry so we had to be very patient in terms of what we did. That was one of our biggest challenges was just to have enough resources to to grow these departments and so on. And, and over time we were we have uh, I think one of our greatest assets in terms of or our organization uh, is the strength and, and the, the, the competence of our department heads and the loyalty and devotion of our staff. I think that was the greatest asset we ever had. Now, do you remember, recall what your departments that were under you in your, I'm sure they changed some over your yeah. 23 years, but... Um, uh, the, uh, by title, the assistant director for retail operations ran the bookstore um, and uh, worked with the, uh, the rental lease shops that we had in the building. Uh, we had an assistant director for food service and catering, uh, which, by title, you know, ran our ran our day-to-day -day food, plus our catering operation, our banquet services, and uh, our food courts. Um, we had um, an associate director for campus life, uh, which over time really grew into a very broad. Uh, uh, and, and kind of unique to College Unions. It was way beyond the Student Unions Activities Board and program. That was a part of our campus life, but that area grew into a, a, a combination of our union program, our Greek life, our international student advisement, our volunteer center, uh, our um, non-traditional students, uh, allied arts, uh, our leadership component, all of those things were within one department headed up by an associate director, and that was Kent Sampson. Ultimately, and isn't that it unusual for, I mean, most of those kind of services would fall under vice president of student affairs. It, it was very, it was very unusual. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I thought very effective mm -hmm. um, uh, because when you start splitting them out, you get a little competition mm -hmm. involved in some of that, for not only for resources, but uh, recognition and all of that and it worked very it was it was uh, extremely unusual and that the forerunner for that or the impetus for that was done before I came in here we just grew it beyond anything we ever knew and that's when uh, Ron Beer early in his career as vice president for student affairs um, dismantled the dean of students office and those functions that reported there were kind of farmed out and the union got student activities, became a part of the student union organization. And that was the genesis of that whole thing growing to what we know now as the Department of Campus Life. Uh, we're still talking about the, the, the organization. Uh, so we had food service, bookstore. Uh, at the time, uh, the manager of the hotel reported to me. Uh, we had a meeting services and conference component of our organization. Um, uh, building so. operations, which mm -hmm. handled our maintenance and our housekeeping. Mm -hmm. Those are the kind, of, and all of those were headed up by managers. They all reported to me, uh, uh, and as a result, our organization was pretty flat. Tom, do you remember total budgets when you came in to the, to the total budget when you left? I, I don't remember the, I don't recall the exact numbers, uh, but it was about fourfold over the 20 some odd years. Uh, roughly early on it was about a four million dollar operation and when I left it was 16 plus or somewhere in there. So it was about, about fourfold. Uh, the pri primary growth in that in terms of budget, uh, a little bit about our budget, the pri primary growth was in the bookstore. Um, we, uh, y you know, we were an auxiliary, we are an auxiliary, mm -hmm. um, meaning that uh, we did not rely on state appropriated funds for the operations of the union. And uh, uh, another kind of financial philosophy we clung to over the years is uh, we kept our student fee. Uh, very low. In fact, our objective every year was to establish a budget where the students didn't didn't uh, pay more than 10 percent 
of the total budget in student fee. Um, and we, we clung to that for a long time, which probably slowed down our, our, our ability to uh, finance large renovation projects. But we, we were, again, <coughs> you asked me earlier on about some philosophy from, from parents and so on was uh, pay-as-you-go kind of thing, and we tried to do that as best we could uh, with the union and rely on some of the economic engines and uh, other uh, uh, self-produced revenue kind of thing to help us meet, meet needs for capital improvements. Tom, what were some of the other revenue streams you mentioned? Your primary one being the bookstore and then the Bookstore, fees. food service, uh, rental income, both for meeting use, uh, and uh, the privately owned shops or income revenue from uh, uh, the parking garage, revenues from the hotel. Uh, one of the real watershed issues uh, historically for us and, and very, very significant for us is, uh, and the best way I can say it is just to get the university to reimburse us for the cost of, of real cost in operating certain offices that were in the building without having to bill you, Jerry Gill, yes. former executive mm -hmm. director of the Alumni Association directly for rent. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a real watershed for us, was for the university to recognize mm -hmm. that the utilities, the housekeeping, the maintenance, and other operating costs for every square foot in this building of, of an agency that was part of, you know, another mm -hmm. part of the university. Uh, to recognize that as as uh, as uh, uh, some revenue for us, and, and we in turn paid our fair share of overhead. But to balance that early on really was a significant thing for us. Tom, from your perspective of 23 years, how or, or has it been? But how has the role of the student union evolved over those years? What what new emerging issues have you seen over that 23 year period? Uh, you know, I, I figured that that question was was coming, but it's uh, it's kind of hard to answer because when you're in it and you're up to your elbows and all of this, it's, car, it's sort of hard to see, you know, quick, rapid changes. It's almost an evolutionary thing that is kind of the ship is turning turning so gently it's hard to to see. Mm. Uh, been a lot of changes in students from, uh, but but at the same time, you know, everything I can say I will contradict myself. The students are still, you know, the heart and soul of what we do. Uh, the students and and the, the the principles and ethics that they bring to this campus have always been special, or still special. Uh, their interests, yeah, they've adjusted a little bit. You know, there have been things we had to give up on that that. Uh, you know, we're no longer of interest to the students. Uh, you know, I'll run across, and I'll get, just give you an example, and it's not to be uh, derogatory uh, in any form or fashion, but uh, you run across alumni who say, oh yeah, I remember, you know, being in the union and bowling and shooting pool. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that will immediately date them in terms of their age <laughs> when they were here. Uh, because we didn't give up on the bowling alley and the pool hall and all of that stuff because it was being overused. Mm -hmm. It was because students had, you know, their interests and needs had gone somewhere else. And, you know, I used to have a favorite saying of, uh, I've never seen a business go out of business because they had too much business. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm not answering that directly, uh, your question directly, except to say we we tried to stay as as, as mobile and as willing to adjust and adapt to what the students and, and the, the university community wanted and needed uh, through those years. Uh, now I can see it if, in terms of a, a facility and the, the plans that they have now m moving a little more back to much more student-oriented uh, um, where we were just to survive economically and to provide and support some of the needs of the campus, uh, 
we had to be careful that we were not becoming a, just a service station, mm -hmm. just a building. And we, you know, one of the greatest misnomers about uh, this union or any college union is when you think about it, most people think about it as bricks and mortar, the facility, the hardcore surface of it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's only its vessel. That's that's the vessel of a college union. The real purpose and meaning is that which occurs within it, the mix of things that re that occur uh, in it, its program. Uh, <clears throat> the facilities only help deliver those kinds of things. Uh, and that is that is something different to almost anyone, you know. What do you use the union for? Well, I just use it for a cup of coffee. Or, well, you know, we meet it, we, we come over here as a study group. Or I come here to get a book. Or I go to the bursar's office. The point is, it's different things to different people. But if it's meeting their needs, mm -hmm. you know, it's doing what it needs to do. Tom, overall, you sort of lead in the question, from your perspective, what, what is or what should be the mission of the, of the OSU Student Union or any student union on a university campus? Well, uh, it's, it's a pretty standard statement. I used to be able to quote it from verbatim, but I'm not sure I can do it now. But it's, uh, uh, you know, it's here to serve, as I've said before, students, faculty, staff, alumni, guests. Uh, it's here to uh, um, supplement and complement the academic mission of the, of the campus, provide social, cultural, recreational kinds of opportunities for students. Um, it's here to provide uh, leadership opportunities. I think leadership development is one of the best, most important things that we could do uh, or facilitate in any college union. It's an opportunity. Uh, you know, my, my main mission, my main concern is, you know, all of the freshmen in the world need, first of all, to imprint on a campus, to feel like they belong, to feel comfortable. And I think that's an important mission of a college union. Not as, not as bricks and mortar. It's bricks and mortar need to make them feel comfortable, make them feel welcome, make them feel a part. But that's only as far as the bricks and mortar can go. It's the program inside that gets them uh, meaningfully engaged in out-of-class activities. Uh, <clears throat> a, a, a group, an activity, an organization they can feel in, involved with. Um, an opportunity to, to learn about themselves in, in mixing and interacting with students that are of different backgrounds, different cultures, different nature, different parts of this state or different parts of the world. Uh, and it's through that kind of interaction and involvement in campus activities in a meaningful way uh, that's important as a part of, of the union's mission. Uh, as I said, leadership development. I think this institution does a great job in, in, in giving students an opportunity to learn about, about organizations, organizational effectiveness, leadership development, all of that stuff I think is extremely important and that's a pr one of the primary missions I think of the union. Of course to provide the day-to-day -day, uh, <coughs> amenities and services that the members of this community need. Come here to get whatever it is you need, whether it's that cup of coffee or whether it's that scholarship out of financial aid. Uh, I think that's an important part of the mission of this. Tom, what, uh, what, is, uh, what have you enjoyed most? You're looking back, what, what did you enjoy most about being uh, director of the student union? I enjoyed putting together the staff, the staffing. Uh, I enjoyed the, plan the, 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 the planning that we did together. I enjoyed seeing our staff grow and develop professionally and personally. Um, so just that that success through others mm -hmm. was was something that really kept my light lit. Mm -hmm. Student interaction, mm -hmm. though sitting in this position, uh, you probably know as well as I do when you know, when you get to a position, 
you don't have that all the time. Uh, you know, further further you go, the less or the more removed you get. But I did enjoy student uh, my interaction with students, and I uh, I, I purposefully um, kept my hand in orange peel mm -hmm. because I enjoyed the direct interaction with orange peel. It was frustrating, and I've got many chapters in a in, in a book that could be <laughs> written about that. <laughs> Uh, but that gave me a, a, a hands-on thing with students. I, I always uh, made sure I developed a, a good working relationship with student government officers. Um, I think I shared, uh, I held a reputation of um, with, with students that I was always fair, I was always direct. Um, if they wanted to know what I thought, they knew I would tell them, uh, hopefully in a very fair way. Uh, and equitable manner, but I enjoyed the student interaction. Uh, enjoyed the planning and the staff and the staff development. Uh, staff development is, uh, you know, and I, I, I've, I've used this before. Maybe it's because I was uh, a, a wannabe athlete early on. A lot of things came back to coaching. Mm -hmm. You know, if you had ever, <clears throat> if a coach had every star player that had ever come through their program, you know, uh, they'd be national champions every year. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, that's a lot of, of what we had, you know. We had some real stars that if you could have kept them, but, you know, they, some of them grew and developed and moved on or got bought by someone else. And uh, uh, But the, the team that is in place now is uh, uh, it's a really outstanding group. And, and hopefully, I, I, not to be... Long whistle here. Ho hopefully, we had something to do with where they are now and their ability to move on. Tom, in fairness, the other side of the coin, what did you enjoy <coughs> the least about being director? Um, I was good at it, but I didn't necessarily enjoy it, and that was the campus politics part of that. Uh, trying to keep the wolves away from the door. I mean, I'm just being blunt about that. Uh, as, as the university grew and developed uh, and changed in its leadership, uh, that was that was really a challenge. Uh, uh, like I say, I was, I, I was good at it. I didn't necessarily enjoy it, but uh, and I, and and that that was no different than any other institution would face. I mean, yeah, I'm not I'm not uh, dissing OSU. I love OSU. And the people in it, so but that, that was kind of a challenge. Uh, I was not. Uh, I was never totally satisfied with what we could achieve um, in our programming effort, mm -hmm. um, and I never was totally comfortable and uh, satisfied with uh, our food service program. I think we had a good. I, I think we have a good program. I think we had a good food service, but you could just see where there was just so much room for growth and improvement, and and we had good staffs in both of those areas. Very dedicated people, uh, but I don't think people really understand how difficult it is mm -hmm. to operate uh, uh, as much. Uh, a food service program as we have and as diversified as that is, it was, it's, it's difficult. But we made some moves through the years to try to adjust and mm -hmm. and uh, do some things that were needed. And I, I think the track that they're on now, we set the, the thing into motion uh, before I left of blending our food services into one university-wide food service program, which I think better serves the, the students. Tom, uh, can you share some of your memorable experiences, uh, key moments, uh, key events in your 23 years? And I know that's asking a lot, but some highlights sure. from those Well, one teams. that I certainly don't want to, it, it may or may not fit in the question, but I sure want it to be uh, uh, recorded in some place. The, the best thing that we ever did for any and all of our students the one best watershed thing that we ever did was establishing the Bursar program, which allowed students to charge their books. And this came about one day after a meeting 
of, of division heads within student services where the, uh, at that time the head of financial aid said, Tom, is there anything that we can do to help students get their books on time? That we have a lot of students who are several weeks into a semester before their aid packages are delivered and they have enough money to buy their books. That puts them three or four weeks behind the, the, the learning curve. Mm -hmm. And I said, I don't know, we'll look at it. So the bookstore manager and I got together and we figured out how that could be done and that, that it could be done and that it should be done and that uh, the, BURS, the, the charge program, in effect, the Bursar uh, account program was already in effect all of those principles were the same as allowing students to get books on time. Uh, so we introduced that program and I, it was the best win-win thing that we ever did. It was a winner for us and it was more than, than, a, than a winner for students. So that, that was one of the best things we ever did. Um, other memories? Uh, Establishing Orange Peel was very challenging, uh, but will always be a memory for me, particularly a couple of uh, events uh, surrounding Orange Peel. I will absolutely never forget the uh, flood that we had uh, one evening, nor the fallout and aftermath of that uh, from August through May in terms of trying to deal with that particular concert that was rained out. Uh, I will absolutely never forget the uh, the exchange that uh, I had with another performer that uh, as a as an educational community we felt was inappropriate so uh, I addressed that issue directly with that individual uh, I'll absolutely never forget that one nor the fallout for the next few weeks with uh, the general public over that particular program uh, but fortunately, we had a very understanding and uh, uh, president and and board at that time, and and we were bigger and better than that performance and survived that. Uh, I'll never forget my first day on the job. I was all excited about coming to be the new union director, and happened to be on a Friday, and Friday is customarily our staff meeting, and I was all fired up with a big motivational speech. Uh, the, you know, the new kid on the block and was going to go in and uh, have great things for this union. And I walked into the building from the, uh, through the hotel lobby and it was about two inches deep in water as I walked in. Uh, someone had stepped on a pipe doing some work upstairs and had flooded the hotel lobby and uh, uh, we had to address that issue immediately. So the first day I ruined a nice pair of shoes and was late to a staff meeting and uh, had to forego my motivational speech. <laughs> you get shelved there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, there's the old saying about, you know, oh, well, I want to get into that, you know. We just did what we had to do right there and, you know, all of the uh, motivational issues had to wait for another time. I, I, I have tons of good memories of of this place and its people. Um, um, one, of the, one of the best things, and we, we used to talk about it all the time, and we meant it, that we were a family. Mm -hmm. And uh, it wasn't just uh, a job mm -hmm. for any and all of us. You know, our deal was saying, hey, you know, uh, all of us have to work for a living. Uh, we're not fortunate enough to be born with silver spoons in our mouth, so we all have to work for a living. We may as well enjoy what we're doing, so let's try to have fun with it. And uh, we kind of, and you know, we are a family. We're here to assist. Uh, you know, our job is about service. Um, you know, this this we are an important part of the institution, but the institution doesn't revolve around us. We are here to serve that institution in any way. And I think all of that was in, thoroughly ingrained into everyone, regardless of what they were doing, regardless of whether they were an apartment head, uh, regardless of uh, whether they were on the housekeeping crew, or uh, K 
cashier and so on. We very seldom had to deal with issues related to how our staff served other people, uh, only on rare occasions. And uh, when somebody was in need, uh, we tried to address those as best we could as a family. And, and that's kind of the way we ran our shop. And as a result, I think we have a very, very loyal crew, uh, loyal staff, uh, a dedicated staff. And I'm not saying dedicated to the director or loyal to the director. Loyal and dedicated to the mission of what we were there to do. And, and we tried to make sure that that permeated all the way through our organization. And uh, I felt pretty good about that. Tom, you're, uh, we talked already about your predecessor, Winston Shindell, mm -hmm. and, and, and Norman Moore. Right. What can you, uh, you can share with us about those two individuals' strengths, uh, things you remember about them, things they brought to this team? <laughs> and if you got some good stories, you'd like to hear those as well. You want me to talk about sure, them? Sure, absolutely. <laughs> that absolutely. may be one of those in that form that I, I choose not to. <laughs> they were all, uh, both of them, well, I, I go back, I, I, I will, uh, you know, Abe Hesser was actually vice president when I started here. Mm -hmm. Uh, as an assistant. He was a legend. Yeah, he's legendary. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I have the deepest respect for all of, all of them. Uh, Winston was a very good friend of mine uh, to begin with. As I said and reflected earlier, he was uh, pretty instrumental in my initial hiring. Uh, he was the first person I met in Stillwater. Uh, we, were, we were friends. Uh, we were colleagues. Um, like I said, I wouldn't be union director if he hadn't planted the seed mm -hmm. um, and, and encouraged me to even consider moving over here. Uh, we were friends and colleagues long after that through our, our, our uh, interaction and involvement in uh, our professional association. Um, we served on uh, its board of directors at different times, but uh, the summer meetings were in Winston's uh, facility, his union at Indiana. So we, we had some very meaningful interaction over this 30 plus years that we've all been together. Uh, Winston was always very organized, um, I think a very intelligent leader. Um, I have nothing but, but good and kind things to say for Winston. Norman, um, uh, I worked for Norman for two years when he was became vice president. I, I, I would say one of the best things, the things, one of the things that sticks out in my mind regarding Norman was, was, uh, uh, Norman was in the right place at the right time in a very bad time in the history of, of Oklahoma State University, and he did an outstanding job with it. Um, Norman had been named interim or acting vice president for student services. Uh, in a year, uh, had been in there a number of months, and it was in the fall, I believe, fall or early spring semester that we had um, an unfortunate incident, uh, racial incident on campus that ultimately resulted in a, a, a boycott of uh, African American students. And it was some very difficult, very touchy times. And I think had we not had Norman at the helm of the student affairs side of what we did, uh, those times would have been much more difficult. He communicated effectively. He met with the students uh, as a group, and that whole group dynamic was very touchy, very uh, uh, in a state of imbalance, and uh, Norman handled that very well. Norman was a good thinker, was a good planner. Um, he, he had a good mind, and he was uh, sometimes uh, stubborn to a point of, uh, of uh, 
discredit for himself, but if he believed in a principle, and he was, and, and generally those principles are right, he was a very uncompromising person, I don't care who you were. He would stick to them, and I, I respected that quite a bit. Uh, Abe was, uh, uh, Abe is legendary. Uh, the ghost of Abe Hesser is still alive and well in this union. <laughs> um, I, this, this may or may not be appropriate, but uh, uh, I had to tell one of our long-standing staff members once, uh, you know, that Abe's no longer the director uh, and that that person needed to learn to think and make decisions on his own uh, because you didn't have to do that when Abe was there. Abe made all the decisions, you just implemented them, <laughs> and I wanted that person to, to grow in terms of you have more information than anyone else has in, in this building uh, and feel free to make decisions based on that information. I'll back you up if you're wrong, I'll tell you you're wrong, but you know, said, your problem is you, you haven't had to think before because Abe didn't want you to think, he wanted you to do what Abe's way. So we always had a, uh, an expression, and I, 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 I love and admire him, and he and I had a great relationship. Um, and one of the greatest compliments that he could make was walking in here and, and saying, hey, you know, you're doing a good job. Uh, it's like Dad saying you're okay, you know. Uh, I'm rambling here, so. It's difficult to comment on your colleagues, but I, I do hold them all in. I learned a lot from all of them, uh, and and hopefully, from the union standpoint, hopefully we built on each other's mm -hmm. uh, careers and accomplishments. Um, they were good people. They did great things with the union, um, and hopefully we've all added to its its lore. So, you're back to talking about your predecessors. If you got a favorite uh, Norman Moore story, you can share with us. It, it gives us sort of a, a glimpse into his uh, his uh, philosophy, and the kind of person he was, or just a good story. <laughs> I don't know that I have any I would like to tell on Norman. Uh, not any any fun stories. Uh, I, an unappreciative story. Uh, as, as I said, you know, I, I worked for him directly for a couple of years, and uh, at that time I was going through some private kind of issues. And uh, Norman and Ruby, uh, I spent a lot of time around Norman and Ruby's kitchen table. Uh, they they kind of took me under their their wing and and uh, made sure I was being well taken care of and that kind of stuff. And I, I never will forget uh, their extending that. Uh, let's see, I mentioned earlier the other story about his uh, outstanding leadership role during difficult time. Uh, I don't have any, any dirty or funny uh, <laughs> anecdotes regarding them. Uh, Winston, again, a lot of my, my, my fun anecdotal things have to do with our, our, our friendships and the times that we uh, spent at his house and other colleagues' houses so when we were young and, and coming up and uh, I, I I will say that uh, you know there was a pretty uh, back during his early days in the Union there was a, a pretty well established uh, movie program as there was in most college unions and uh, I don't think it was extremely inappropriate, but there were a lot of those movies we watched in their living room and, and den where the projector would be wagged home, taken home, and uh, some of our friends would be invited over to see a special showing of the movie that was about to be shown the next day <laughs> in, in the Union. But uh, we, we had some good times. We uh, There were some dinner parties that the dean of students used to uh, used to 
throw for us that uh, would have some other kinds of memories of Winston and some of our other colleagues and uh, how much we enjoyed some of those small fell parties, but I don't think I want to go into detail. <laughs> couple of historical questions. Henry G. Bennett, president of Oklahoma State University, created the master plan and his probably the two iconic buildings were the, of course first and foremost the library but then right right behind it, Student Union. Uh, what did, did he have it right about the importance of the Student Union and, and uh, then I want to uh, we'll have a follow-up question to that in a minute. He had it exactly right. Mm -hmm. uh, you know I, I still am amazed if you think about Oklahoma State University during, uh, you know, post-war, uh, because you have to think, well, this was open in 50, but that is only five years, you know, post-war. Uh, uh, can you imagine the impact on this campus of the student union coming out of the ground, the library coming out of the ground, Bennett Hall coming out of the ground at the same time? Uh, it, it put that in that historical perspective of, uh, it was just huge, a huge undertaking for this campus, knowing its its background mm -hmm. and all of that. Uh, yes, he had it right, and he had it right for the union. I can't speak for others, but uh, the other buildings, but uh, for the union and for the unique nature of how this thing was funded, mm -hmm. it was the first college union uh, built with with uh, with student fee support without appropriated monies uh, and the message that 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 gave of students being willing to assess themselves a fee to pay for a facility uh, of this nature was incredible at that time uh, and and that kind of set the way for most other college unions prior to that there were other other ways uh, that they were financed and so on. But yes, he had it right. Yes, they did it right in terms of how they designed uh, uh, the facility, the, the quality of the facility. Uh, uh, this building could not and would not be built in this day and age with the kind of amenities and the quality of construction in it uh, had it not been for his leadership and uh, that of some others that traveled around, looked at other facilities. Uh, this building is kind of an amalgamation of a number of, of buildings uh, based on some travel that they did in the planning of it and so on. But yes, Bennett had it right. Tom, uh, the uniqueness of the funding, you know, in terms of bond indebtedness was the first time that I know of and I yeah. you shared that the student union uh, and, and very few even campus buildings, period, but certainly student right. union was, was funded that way. The genius of that is, is certainly there. But let's step back a minute and re recall some of your conversation earlier. It was also having to retire that debt. Yeah. And when you did every, and, and yeah. people think maybe that was one time, but every time we went to a major renovation, right. then we would we'd add on that bonded debt, and so we'd get paid off, then you'd add on right. to it. How did that, that balance between programming uh, reaching the students, the public alumni you're talking about, but then at the same time you've got this, the, uh, and I'll say pressure, okay, financial pressure, of being sure that you're paying the bills, paying off the bond deadness. How did, how did that impact you? Your thoughts on that? It was a struggle. Uh, in, in fact, I think one of the longest and hardest struggles we had was from something that was very good uh, and very significant in 1978, which was a few years prior to my coming into the union, but in 78, uh, the, the renovation of the, of the food, the creation of the food court, and that whole design on the first floor uh, was a several million dollar bond, and the effective of that bond, I mean, the product was good, but the effect of the bond was we inherited the term of the bond which and it was bonded to to its max capacity at that point so for the next uh, uh, it was a 30-year bond so 
you know, the 20 some odd years I was there, I was strapped with the bond that I inherited. Um, so we had to make sure that, uh, you know, the economic engine was still in place to mm -hmm. pay off those bonds and the same thing. And uh, I, I'll, I'll be quite honest about it. When we moved in, we were so strapped financially. Uh, I would not have moved into the union as a union director had there not been a transfer of, of, of funds from a, another student affairs agency. At the time, Pat Hoffler, was, who was assistant vice president for student services, was the financial guy. And had a, had, fortunately, he had a philosophy of, uh, uh, of any, any reserves on deposit for student services. Uh, it, it belonged to any and all. Mm -hmm because the union had a, had a million dollar cash deficit in 1982, which was taken care of by some reserve funds out of residential life. A transfer was made to, to balance that negative cash flow, or I would not have come over here. Mm -hmm. uh, but that at least set that. And then the challenge was, well, okay, let's pay for the debt. And I, I, I'll give you a prime example of how, how poor we were at one time. The east doors, uh, the doors of the east entrance of the union, when I walked into the building, were broken. I don't mean the glass is broken. I mean some of the main supporting structure of those doors, I mean, they were broken in half. And my deal was, we may be poor, but it doesn't have to look that way. So we put two pieces of, of, of steel metal plate, bolted them together just to hold the doors together, and painted over them. Mm -hmm because we couldn't afford to change the doors. Uh, we we uh, convinced uh, Jay Boggs, the Vice President for Academic Affairs, that our, our uh, uh, some of our meeting rooms that had uh, AV screens in them all torn, that they were being used for academic purposes and so mm -hmm. on. Would you please provide us some uh, audio-visual assistance by repairing some of the, by replacing? So we were, you know, begging and borrowing and trying to do as much as we could to get by uh, because we were strapped. Now, on the other hand, one of our greatest, I think, accomplishments as a team, which we, we did by early on developing a master plan for where we wanted things to be in the building and the projects and some priorities on projects, and we began a pay-as-you-go kind of thing, and we were able to do some things to accomplish some things uh, in terms of some improvements in the building that uh, as a team, I'm quite proud of the teamwork. Uh, we re-engineered the bookstore uh, and made it much more uh, user-friendly uh, because we felt like given the, the cramped quarters and space that we had uh, and some other marketing things that we wanted to do with it in terms of trying to upgrade our student store uh, up and, and opening our office supplies and putting our textbooks where students could get to them but they wouldn't necessarily be in the way on a day-by-day -day basis. A lot of re-engineering of that really helped turn that bookstore around and generate more money. We, uh, we had to generate more money in terms of rental income so we had a lot of uh, lounge space, particularly on the third floor. Uh, all of the west side of that building was total lounge space, crumbling to dust. We didn't have the money to renovate, but there was a pent-up need for some office space and so on. So we began to move in that direction for rental income. So we made some adjustments along the way without having to. We, we, we did the first uh, renovation of the hotel during that time. Uh, we spent a whopping sum of like uh, 1.1 million dollars and, and I say the whopping sum and I say that in jest you get that right which wasn't a whole lot of money at that time in the renovation of the hotel and the bookstore uh, and the, and that was a pay-as-you-go thing. We did not incur any additional debt. All these projects I'm about to mention did not incur additional debt because we didn't have any bond capacity. In addition to paying off the bond, we uh, uh, did the bookstore, we did the hotel, we did a lot of repair work on the parking garage. Um, 
even the student services center that was added onto this building was done without in, uh, without additional indebtedness to the union, um, and and that was some stars lining up budgetarily with the rest of the university and using some other funds available for mm -hmm. non-student union kinds of things uh, that did that. But we were able to do that, uh, all those projects, uh, do the renovation of um, the, the, the ultimate renovation of the hotel. Um, there's a story within itself. Uh, it was a big learning curve for me and a lot of others in terms of how to get through some things done. Uh, by first of all giving up, you know, you, you give it up to let it come back to you in terms of a facility far greater than anything that we could have afforded and, and not been able to raise the private money that, that uh, uh, the academic unit could. Uh, but what's the magic of us running it? There's nothing magic of us running it. If it can grow, it's like, it's like a child, you know, you want it to go and be bigger and better than it, than it could be if you stayed under mama's apron strings. Uh, even that was done without uh, any real additional indebtedness. Uh, we helped them get a bond, but we were guaranteed payment on that. Um, and we were able to accomplish all of that stuff uh, by paying as you go, which was pretty significant, I think, achievement over, the, over that. Plus, pay off the bond that we were strapped with from 78 bond. We paid that off about five or six years earlier. Because, and I will say this, in leaving the union, uh, I took a great satisfaction that our debts were paid we had no indebtedness. We then therefore had some bond capacity for additional bonding by someone in the future. We had a few million dollars in, in reserve. We had an audit in which there were no findings, so we left it in good shape. And, and I, I don't know what questions are coming forth, but. Uh, I will tell you, part of my decision after 23 years was it's in good shape financially, physically. We're at the threshold of needing a major renovation. That major renovation from start to finish, and you know this as well as I do in terms of building, is 10 years from start to finish. I don't think it would be good for the, for the union for me to do that. And it, it, because the person who would follow me would, in a sense, follow the same situation that I moved into, and that was strapped financially mm -hmm. with a design that wasn't yours. Mm -hmm. And I said, I don't think I want to do that. I think it's in good shape. It's debt-free. There's um, there's a reserve. Uh, all the accounting is in order. It's time for me to move aside and let somebody else lead that. I don't need it. I don't need to, you know, let that person star shine, let that person be hands-on involved in the initial design of whatever renovation. We left a whole bunch of ideas among our management staff, which you can look in over this past four years, see a lot of that come to fruition. Um, some of those ideas are blended into the plan for the renovation. And, I take a lot of satisfaction in that, and I think I got out at a good time. Tom, you really led nicely into my final question, and it's a personal question, but think about it a minute. Uh, and looking back, you know, your 23 years as director of the student union, uh, how do you hope people remember Tom Keyes? <clears throat> I, I don't mean to be flippant, but uh, you know, I told some of my staff in six months nobody will remember I ever was ever here. Um, um, I hope people will, if they do remember, will remember a person that was uh, dedicated and committed to uh, the union as a facility, the union as a service, 
uh, the union as its people, uh, that I was dedicated to, to all of that, that I was open to, uh, to change, um, not just change for the sake of change, but very well considered change. Um, that would keep the union kind of at the forefront of student needs and campus needs. Uh, you know, I had somebody from another another uh, part of the university tell me one time, he said, man, you guys are fun over there because you're always willing to try something. There's always something new, something different coming online. Uh, and I said, yeah, you know, we're willing to try things. We don't succeed at all of them. But, you know, I, I'd like to be known that way. Um, I would like to be known as a, a person who's fair. Uh, uh, th there are probably other sides of me that some of my staff will remember me for, and that's uh, uh, sometimes I was a pretty spirited person, <laughs> pretty, uh, pretty frank, um, pretty straightforward. And I and and I, I don't apologize for that. I I just feel like uh, I I always wanted people to know where I stood, and I always stood on the side of trying to do what was right for the union and the people we served. Um, to protect that as much as I was forced to have to protect that in in uh, in the community. Um, uh, and that could, you know, lead a group that would hopefully make some good decisions. And um, but now, realistically, I know that um, I may not be remembered at all. <laughs> uh, no. um, thanks. Okay. Sure. Is there anything we've left out? You'd like to meet no, I think there are bits and pieces of uh, throughout all of that. It's probably much, much too wordy, but I think uh, I tried to make known what I think I needed to make known. Sorry, I was too so. You were known for you were known for being passionate about the student union. Uh, I remember that, and you defended your your charter, and I mean in a positive way. Well, I mean you you, you state your case, the importance of it, and. Which was your role in your job? Well, and, and I, I think everybody who, sh who served in positions yeah. similar to ours, you know, you had to take a passion. Yeah. You, you had to hold that. And uh, um, the operation of the union is, yeah, I mean, literally, and I hate to use the expression because it's overused, but literally, uh, the union is a is a 24/7 operation. There's never not somebody in this building, and from a union director's standpoint, you know you had you needed to have a visibility among all of your staff, and and a, and a show of support for that which was going on in the building. So. Uh, I don't want to overstate this, but short of being president of the university, you know, a union director could be here any and all times and, and pulled a, in a number of, of directions, physically, emotionally, financially, mentally, and so on. So, uh, not to overstate it, but it, it, it could, if you don't keep your priorities in order, uh, it can be quite taxing. Balance it's about. a juggling act. We used to talk about the old Ed Sullivan show where the guy would spin saucers all the time, you know. He'd stand in there and he'd run over and grab this one and that. And so we spun a lot of saucers in 23 years. And I'm sorry to say I'm old enough to remember those. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, Tom, okay. thanks for taking sure. time. Thanks for